All right, so Vesper does a very nice job predicting our molecular geometry, but it does have its limits. If we're going to understand bonding, then we need to investigate a little more into quantum mechanics. And the two theories we look at, one is the valence bond theory. That's the one we've already talked about where orbital hybridization. And what we're going to look at just a tiny bit here today is molecular orbital theory. So molecular orbital theory, it basically talks about the superposition of atomic orbitals. In other words, a linear combination of atomic orbital wave functions. So we're going to be, remember all, all of this comes from the very complex solving of Schrodinger's equation. And we have the mathematical solutions being the, atomical, the atomic orbitals. So when we take atoms and put them together to make molecules, then we can have orbitals combining either constructively or destructively. And yes, I know there's a typo here from the screenshot that I took. Um, you can see that it says constructively. I just thought that was funny. Sorry. Um, but yes, yeah, so our waves can combine constructively or destructively. And so that's what can happen with our orbitals, since our orbitals are solutions to these wave functions. So when orbitals combine in phase, we create bonding orbitals. And when they combine out of phase, then we have anti-bonding. And you can see that right now we are looking at the addition of s orbitals. Okay, And when we have the addition of s orbitals in phase, then we have a sigma 1s orbital, molecular orbital. And if it's anti-bonding out of phase, then we have a sigma star 1s orbital. Again, don't freak out too much about this. We're going to look and see it. some questions we might be asked to answer about this. But for right now, um, let's just look at the next combination. Here, again, these were s orbitals combining. What about p orbitals? Well, if we know that we have p orbitals in x, y, and z planes, well, if p orbitals go at each other head on, then you will produce a sigma bond. And if it's in phase again, we'll get a sigma 2p. And if it's out of phase, we'll get a sigma star 2p. More importantly to us is the side on overlap and we'll produce a pi bond. Okay, when we produce a pi bond, we're going to see these in our double and triple bonds. And so, again, we can have pi star if it's out of phase addition, or just regular pi if it's in phase. And this is like a little drawing that associates the energy with the molecular orbitals. And essentially, while you won't have to fill out or complete one of these, especially on the AP exam, that's the bottom down there, but you may get if you take a course in college you might get a professor that will want you to complete these but um, essentially what it's showing us is that the atomic orbitals that are on the sides 2s 2p 2s 2p the atomic orbitals have a higher energy than the molecular orbitals the molecular orbitals are down and that makes sense when we bond we typically find that we will have a less energetic state than coming straight from the atoms. And you'll also note that the antibondings, the stars, are up higher than the regular, than the bonding orbitals. So there you see the sigma 2p at a lower energy spot than the sigma star 2p. Or you see the pi 2p at a lower spot than the pi star 2p. Okay, so again, 
if you need to reference this at some point in time in the future, then you at least have this to look at. This is a little expert from expert, sorry, <laughs> excerpt from the college board talking about sigma and pi bonds. And what it tells us is the smaller atoms in the first main row of the periodic table may engage in a different type of bonding. If two hat atoms have at least one electron in a p orbital, a side to side overlap can occur and we would conform a pi molecular orbital or a pi bond. And the common examples that it was pointing to, ethene and ethine. Okay, ethene is two carbons linked together with a double bond, and then there's hydrogens filling up the rest of the available spots for bonds for the carbon. The first bond in the double bond is sigma. The second bond becomes is the pi bond and we see that the overlap is above and below the bond and that's going to be important here in one second. Ethine has a triple bond. Again the first bond is a sigma and then the second and third bonds will be pi. And what this does is it inhibits bond rotation. A sigma bond, a single bond, allows rotation between the atoms that are bonded. A pi bond inhibits this. And so this is a, a brief little glimpse into some organic chemistry. But we can have, here you see across a double bond, if we have, let's call this an active site, or let's call this a... Um, a halogen or some other type of atom, then we can have them on opposite sides of the double bond, which is called a trans situation, or we can have them on the same side of the double bond, which is called a cis situation position. And again, this pops up every once in a while, but double bonds and triple bonds do not allow for bond rotation. There was a question on last year's AP exam that referenced cis and trans compounds and it freaked some kids out because they hadn't maybe heard of that or remembered it from when we talked about it. But realistically, that didn't have any part in the actual question. They just got freaked out by those names. So I at least wanted to, you to see this in case that happens again. Now here's a great task they could ask you. Here are some molecules, and they want us to determine how many sigma bonds and how many pi bonds are in this molecule. And so, again, the biggest misconception is that a double bond or a triple bond, in this first molecule, I have two double bonds. And yes, that means that I have two pi bonds. How many sigma bonds are there? A lot of people might say seven because they might just count the single bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But remember, there is a sigma bond in each double bond. The first bond is a sigma bond. So overall, in this molecule, there are nine sigma bonds. Down below, we have a triple bond. And in the triple bond, there are two pi bonds and one sigma bond. Okay, so in this molecule, again, we have two pi bonds, and then all the single bonds are sigmas plus one of the bonds in the triple bond. So there are 12 sigma bonds. Again, molecular orbital theory is just that. It is a theory that will explain what's happening as far as bonding is concerned. It comes from Schrodinger's equation. It's very mathematical. It, it comes from the overlapping of these orbitals and viewing them as wave functions. And so the big thing though is that the molecular orbitals are at a lower energy than the atomic orbitals and this designation of sigma bonds and pi bonds. Sigma single bonds and pi bonds being seen in our double and triple bonds. I hope this helps and I'll talk to you later.